China in historic transition. Challenges and risks abound. China's problems are daunting. Slower growth, social imbalances, industrial overcapacity, massive pollution, global volatility. How to address such diverse, complex issues? China has an overarching integrated strategy. It's called the five major development concepts. Innovative development, coordinated development, green development, open development, shared development. How can China continue to open up its economy in new energetic ways and benefit the global community, especially less developed countries? In this episode, Rosa explores the fourth major concept, open development. Opening up is, in itself, not new. In the late 1970s, especially after the third plenary of the 11th Central Committee of the Communist Party of China in 1978, China made reform and opening up the core of its national policy. As a direct result, China has become the world's second largest economy. Now, opening up must develop further, attain a new level. But how is this new kind of opening up different from the original? Shanghai, it's one of my favorite cities. I couldn't count how many times I've been here. Shanghai is China's dynamic commercial center. For almost three decades, it's been at the forefront of China's opening up, exemplified by Pudong. Still talking about opening up being a major part of China's strategy. So I have to ask, what are the deficits that haven't been uh, 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 bridged during this 40-year period that opening up still needs to be at the highest level of China's strategy. Reform and opening up in China started in 1978. Almost 40 years afterwards, we're still talking about opening up. But in my understanding, the same wording signifies different meaning today, different in which ways, mainly in four aspects. First, in 1978, our opening up is only one way. That is, we're only bringing in instead of going out. But today, as we talk about opening up, we're referring to both bringing in and going out two ways. But second, what does the past opening up actually mean? It means bringing in foreign capital. But today, we've expanded the scope to not only capital, but also trade facilitation, reforms in financial systems, and a lot more. Third, what do we use to depend on for opening up? We depended on resources, environment, and cheap labor. But what about in the future? In the future, we will forge our competitiveness in the environment of trade and system. Fourth, opening up back then is under strict government regulation, but today the market plays more important roles. Therefore, 40 years apart, opening up remains a topic of concern and an important part of the five major development concepts, only that there are hugely different connotations in between. Let's project forward. Let's take each one of those new kinds of opening up mm -hmm. into the future. What would you call success for these new kinds of opening up? In my mind, opening up in a new era is bilateral, cross-field, and business-favorable opening up where the market plays a decisive role. This is our goal in the modern time. Tremendous changes can be noted in the same wording between now and then. The China-Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone opened in 2013 and it now covers an area of just over 120 square kilometers. It includes four special custom supervision zones, Lujatsui Financial District, 
Jinxiao Export Processing Zone, Zhangqiang High Tech Park, and behind me is the Wai Gaoqiao Bonded Logistics Park, China's first. Let's find out what the free trade zone is all about. To pioneer this new kind of opening up, the China Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone was established on September 29, 2013. It has carried out institutional reforms and innovation in areas of investment, foreign trade, finance, and post-filing supervision, all to facilitate investment and trade within the zone. Foreign companies in the Shanghai Free Trade Zone are primarily in trade, finance, and service industries. Li Chi Kiat is an opening up pioneer, working in China for more than two decades, beginning with the China Singapore Suzhou Industrial Park in the 1990s. Under his guidance, the Singapore based international healthcare provider Raffles chose the Shanghai Free Trade Zone to establish a world class comprehensive hospital and scheduled to open in 2019. Give me specifics of what are the kinds of policies here in the free trade zone that makes your capacity to do world-class business in healthcare easier here than in other places? The seizing of the land, the development of the building, the approvals, the submissions. Well, of course, we owe much to Lu Jiazui Group, our partner, that have been working well and coordinating well with us. And, uh, Without all these open and transparent policies, we would not have a well-built plan to have a foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. And most of the things that we have done at the moment, uh, within the time frame, we have set for ourselves. So I would say this is a plus for the free trade zone. Mm -hmm. And what is more important, the free trade zone itself is improving and formulating policies better and better each day. And this will spur companies like us mm -hmm, uh, to aim for an even brighter future. How is the China Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone organized and how does it work? Behind me is the administrative center. They claim that the registration process is much simpler. Let's find out. In the administrative center of the Shanghai FTZ, there are windows for industry and commerce, tax administration, customs, frontier inspection, and other business matters. One counter handles all formalities, such as approving foreign investment projects, enterprise registration, and overseas investment registration. Companies complete the entire process in the same place, rather than needing to go to several different places as they did prior. Chin Bei used to work on foreign enterprise registration before the establishment of the Shanghai FTZ. She has witnessed the changes and appreciates the streamlined working process. Compare the many years you worked here before the uh, free trade zone and after the free trade zone. What are the differences? I think the procedure became more and more easy and simple. Uh -huh. Because uh, uh, before the free trade zone uh, opens, the foreign companies should applicate for the government approval right. for to set up a new uh, right, company. Right, right. But uh, uh, after the free FT zone uh, opens, they just uh, uh, applicate for the business license. It's okay, they can uh, begin their business. The free T zone attract more and more investors because they, they say the uh, procedure is much easier. In the recent days, uh, there's uh, about uh, nearly 20 new companies in free FT zone. I got my business license, the organization code certificate, and the certificate of taxation registration into one document the first time I came here. And I was told to get my one integrated certificate just three days afterwards. It feels really good as we can get all things done directly here all at once. The current policies are great, more than great. I understand why foreign companies are here for favorable import policies. But why are many Chinese companies also registering in the Shanghai Free Trade Zone? How do domestic companies benefit by operating here? 
In 2015, the Shanghai Free Trade Zone was expanded, including the Lu Jiaxue Financial District and Commercial Center, where major multinational and Chinese companies have their headquarters. Now accounting for about a quarter of Shanghai's GDP, the zone has more than 36,000 new enterprises, of which more than 5,700 are foreign. The zone's objective is to encourage competition and enable common development. Shanghai Origin Supply Chain Management is one domestic logistics company, which has witnessed the changes and development. Before the FTC was established, this was just a traditional bonded warehouse. All the goods must be cleared to get in the warehouse and complete importation. Now everything becomes convenient and easy through an application model entering the FTC before the warehouse. At the same time, the FTC has launched a network-based supervision. Such operation greatly boosts companies' efficiency and convenience in doing businesses and can raise their profit margin by 60 percent. So we know the meaning of the breakthrough in creating a free trade port area in the FTZ and in simplifying customs inspection, etc. These are all favorable policies for business development. I'd like to reverse the question. Normally we ask, how are you applying the five major development concepts? That's a top-down approach. Mm -hmm. Let's do a bottoms-up approach and ask from your experience as Party Secretary of Budong, Chairman of the Free Trade Zone, how can your experiences help enrich the five major development concepts, expand their um, uh, way of thinking and their uh, um, import? The very core of an FTZ is to open up, but what we want to do is more than opening up itself. Rather, we hope to push for government's reform through opening up. Reform of the FTZ has introduced the concept of the negative list. That is, I specify things that are not allowed on the list, so you can do whatever as long as they are off the list. We promote changes in government's function and improvement in government's governance through experiments in the Pudong Pilot FTZ. I believe we can make our contributions to the country. We can contribute our own share in the FTZ. An important innovation in the Shanghai FTZ allows the first joint operation between a foreign law firm, Baker & McKenzie, and a Chinese counterpart, Funshun Partners. This pioneering arrangement enables Chinese lawyers employed by foreign law firms to work on local law anywhere in China, including representing client companies in local courtrooms. It also enables foreign law firms to access their global supply chains, using low-cost back-office operations in other countries to reduce legal costs to clients in China. China benefits overall in that its legal industry will progress towards international standards. Up until this uh, FTZ uh, liberalization, it's never been possible for international firms to be able to combine uh, seamlessly with uh, PRC law firms to offer Chinese local law advice and international law advice in the same platform. So this is the first ever. So our license uh, was only officially approved in middle of April, 15th April 2015. It's been just over a year and we're very encouraged. Um, uh, we've had uh, more than 60 projects together already in just the last 12 to 13 months um, with uh, function partners through the joint platform more than half of which are M&A transactions, either going into China or going out from China. So we're very encouraged by, by the good start so far. In 2015, China's foreign trade topped 24 trillion RMB, giving opening up new meaning. Enhancing opening up, in addition to the Shanghai Free Trade Zone, China has now established free trade zones in Tianjin, Guangdong and Fujian provinces. In April 2015, Tianjin, Guangdong and Fujian pilot free trade zones were established. 
The Guangdong FTZ is focusing on enhancing cooperation between Guangdong Province, Hong Kong, and Macau. The Tianjin FTZ is facilitating the coordinated development of Beijing, Tianjin, and Hubei Province. The Fujian FTZ, nearest to Taiwan, is concentrating on economic relations with Taiwan and on building the Maritime Silk Road. But what's the future of free trade zones? How can they facilitate further China's new kind of opening up? In specific, what roles does the Shanghai Pilot FTZ play in the implementation of the five major development concepts? First, it has to be the icebreaker. This is a requirement put forth by Premier Li Keqiang when he came in. We need to make breakthroughs where it used to seem impossible and solve problems that used to seem unsolvable. Second, it serves as a test field, that is, for things that we're not so sure about. We can have a try in the pilot FTZ. Third, it works as a pressure tester. Why so? Well, in our test, some international rules may not work well with China. Others may be simply useless. Still others may even engender risks. Through our pressure tester, we can spot rules that induce risks, identify what risks they are, and how the government should manage to control them. So this is also an important function of the pilot FTZ. Generally, I conclude three roles that our FTZ can play in opening up of the five major development concepts, an icebreaker, a test field, and a pressure tester. These are important functions we perform in opening up. In addition to free trade zones, other large projects are advancing China's opening up policy. For example, the Belt and Road Initiative with dozens of developing countries, selling high-speed rail globally, even Chinese companies acquiring foreign companies. China's new kind of opening up adds a global perspective, befitting China's rise. The Belt and Road Initiative is China's major strategy to foster economic cooperation among more than 60 countries. The Silk Road Economic Belt links China, Central Asia, Russia, and Europe. The Maritime Silk Road links China with Southeast Asia, South Asia, the Indian Ocean, the Persian Gulf, the Mediterranean Sea, and East Africa. In order to make the economic ties closer, mutual cooperation deeper, and settlement broader between the Eurasian countries, we can innovate the mode of cooperation and jointly build the Silk Road economic belt. This is a great course that will benefit people along the route. It will promote work in all areas by drawing upon the experience gained on key points. It will gradually enhance overall regional cooperation. Now China's open development strategy is mainly on two fronts. One is to gain new momentum through innovation, so that Chinese products can get competitive edge in international trade and can expand their global market share. And the other is that China is actively exploring new models for international cooperation. As a developing country, China is actively exploring new models for international cooperation. Theoretically speaking, in the past, international economic coordination was more between developed countries and developing ones. That's to say, it was between countries at different stages in their development, so that their products could be complementary to one another. As a developing country, China has promoted the Belt and Road Initiative to a strategically high level. It wants to work with other developing countries to form a community of common interests, common fate and common responsibility. Another aspect of opening up that Chinese leadership talks about is uh, going abroad. The Belt and Road policy, for example, uh, where Chinese uh, railroads, construction, uh, infrastructure are being built in, in many countries uh, that, that need it. And so China is engaging more with the world. It's not just uh, opening up internally here, but China going out to the world. H how does that whole um, 
uh, new strategy of China engaging the world uh, help China's own transformation? I think it's important in the, long, in the long term. In the short term, I would caution that you have to be very skeptical about its success. China is not the first country to, to embark on this going out program. We've seen many countries, when they're running large investment accounts, go abroad, and they almost always misprice risk. Um, but that doesn't mean it's a bad idea, because at some point they're going to have to go abroad. That's a necessary part of the globalization of Chinese businesses to go abroad. It's important to understand why the previous cases failed in order to avoid those mistakes. Though the way may be bumpy, the Belt and Road Initiative is being implemented. The longest railway tunnel in Central Asia has been completed in Uzbekistan. It's one of the landmark projects on the Silk Road economic belt. And the railway linking the capitals of Hungary and Serbia is also under construction. Upon its completion, traveling times by train between Budapest and Belgrade will be reduced from eight hours to less than three. China is also developing high-speed railways in other countries, such as Thailand. High-speed railways exemplify China's new kind of global opening up. 那么，作为像高铁这样的走出去，我理解就是说。For high-speed rail, their going out represents how competitive industries or products are getting involved in the general market for competition. China is competitive in this industrial field and can start construction directly abroad, modeling on domestic success. This shows how we are expanding our development size and scale based on our strength in the two resources and two markets. This is a natural choice following the tide of the market. I think it's common practice for enterprise to go out in a larger market environment and a market mechanism. This is nothing unique to China. As long as the company wants to grow its size and scale in the global context of two resources and two forms of markets, going out is only a natural result. It fits the general pattern for enterprises to develop. The global presence of Chinese companies is being enhanced by mergers and acquisitions. An increasing number have begun investing in overseas markets and acquiring foreign companies, contributing to China's economic transformation and creating jobs in the host countries. Chinese companies and funds with distribution channels in China's markets are connecting with advanced overseas technologies and management expertise, creating new kinds of multinational competitors in an increasingly globalized world. Bright Food is China's fourth largest dairy company. With 10 overseas acquisitions in only five years, it has a good start. Its first M&A deal was completed in 2010 when the company bought 51% of New Zealand dairy operator Sinlight for 58 million U.S. dollars. It was a milestone. It was the first time an overseas acquisition by a Chinese company resulted in the foreign company being cleared to list on its own local stock market. Over the 30 plus years of reform and opening up, we are experiencing changes in the new stage. For example, in the past, we mainly relied on bringing in. Now, we need to shift our focus towards going out and increase exports of energy, raw materials and manpower by investing abroad. And the, the purpose of opening up, it seems to me, is really to allow companies that are able to compete at the global level to be forced into competing with the best form to drive domestic, uh, domestic innovation. If you don't allow that, you are better off in the short term because your local companies grow at the expense of foreign companies, but you are much worse off in the long term because foreign companies continue to increase their productivity whereas local companies don't. And really it seems to me that that's the main purpose of opening up for China to make sure that over the long term, Chinese innovation keeps pace with global innovation. So we need to gradually enhance our going out, combine import and export, and improve the open economic system so that the Chinese economy can better integrate into the global economy.
In this way, the world can also share the opportunities that can boost China's development and China's huge market. In implementing the five major development concepts, what are your biggest challenges? In my view, as we promote implementation of the five major development concepts, we face challenges from several aspects. First, government's governing capabilities, innovation, coordination, green, openness, sharing. The words are simple, but they all represent demanding requirements for the traditional way and capability of government's governance, the latter of which also makes the top I've ever met. The second challenge is on participation of the society. Each of the five concepts calls for social participation. But what is the scenario today? The society actually lacks sufficient participation. The social system of integrity, the quality and quantity of social organizations are still somewhat in the lack. The third problem is a lack of system integration. Pudong has undergone 26 years of reform and opening up and achieved some experiences that match well with the five major development concepts. But they are still incomprehensive, isolated and sparsely established. To make a comparison, it is like we have a lot of beads scattered on the floor, but we haven't chained them up into beautiful necklaces or bracelets. That is, we haven't tried enough to integrate system innovation. This is a challenge we face in promoting the five major development concepts in the FTZ in my mind. In my view, we have to respond actively to address the three problems. First, the government should transform its traditional functions. The past government operation model must be abandoned. The government should transform its function, streamline administration, and optimize service to strike a proper balance between strengthening regulation and delegating power. So, generally speaking, the so first, transforming government's functions. How to make it? Through streamlining administration balancing between strengthening regulation and delegating power and optimizing services. Second, enhancing top-level design. I'm not referring to the common practice. Rather, we should strengthen the dynamic top-level design. What does it mean? While constant improvement is needed to improve the systematic and integrated value of policies. Third, promoting social organizations. I mean boosting their willingness and ability to participate in the development. So in the coming season, Pudong is going to focus on these three areas to achieve better development. China is not further opening up to please foreigners. China is further opening up because it's a domestic necessity. Opening up today means much more than it meant 35 years ago. Opening up now means making it easier, faster, and more efficient to do all kinds of business. This includes non-state-owned investments in industries and sectors previously off-limits for private companies, like energy and healthcare. This includes Chinese companies going abroad, doing business everywhere, supporting the Belt and Road Initiative, building infrastructure and selling high-speed rail, even acquiring foreign companies. Opening up also means that foreign companies should enter more industries in China and have less restrictions. In short, opening up means expanding the mind, enlarging China's economic possibilities. Nothing less can enable China's economic transformation. It's a new kind of opening up. It's an attitude of openness, which we watch to keep closer to China.